in, 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 in three pages or less. Yeah, in three pages or less. I mean, if you're going to do a dissertation, do it on something that matters. <laughs> So what, where? Board workshop to order. It is Friday, August 28th, and we are having a special board workshop to talk about two issues, um, the Board of Education self-evaluation and a review of the 0910 board focus goals. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we do have Spanish translation available. <laughs> yes, we're going to have audience. we're going to have our our audience translate. Okay. Good morning. Buenos días, mi nombre es Sandra Trujillo y estoy aquí para ser la intérprete de la reunión de esta noche o de este mañana. Si alguien necesita ayuda, por favor vean a hablar conmigo. Estoy al fondo del salón. Gracias. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sandra. And we also have headsets available for the hearing impaired. I, uh, next up is A2, public comment. I don't believe we have public comment at this time. So we will go ahead and move on with the conference agenda. Item B1, discussion of board of education self-evaluation. Um, Bob and Susan put this form together a number of months ago now, so many uh, thanks. More Susan and Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for getting that, this together. Um, and we received it a few weeks ago now and filled it out and turned it back in, and Mimi put together um, a uh, sort of a, an overall survey of where everybody uh, stood on these issues. Um, there were 30 questions that you could rank from strongly agree to strongly disagree, and then there was the opportunity to say if they, uh, if we felt that they were important um, to our uh, functioning as a board or not. And then there was also uh, a few open-ended questions at the end. Um, I would like to just read off the open-ended questions to start because then I thought we could just take a look at each one uh, of the questions that we answered and see where we all stood on that. Um, so I'm just going to read these off for, for uh, the sake of members of the public uh, who might want to see this DVD at some point. And the first question was, what are the board's greatest strengths? Um, and board members are generally concerned about the welfare of students and staff. Board members work hard and are well prepared for meetings. Most board members actively participate in school events and visit school sites to help inform their decision making. That was a sample from what are the board's greatest strengths. Um, what are the board's greatest weaknesses? Here's a sample from that one. Um, failure to effectively communicate to the public rationales for decision making and allowing negative scenarios to overshadow strengths and accomplishments. Failure at times of the board to work together for the common good. Upon occasion, catering to special interest groups that are not representative of the school community as a whole. A sample from the third question, which was, are there things related to the board you'd like to see changed? Please be, please be as specific as possible. Um, there, were, there was a, a lot of different direction on this one, so I hesitate to just read off one of them. Um, but maybe we can talk about this one uh, more in detail at the end. Um, and number four was how could the board do its job better? Um, and this one, uh, a sample answer was work better in concert as a board to achieve mutual go goals, avoid using special interest groups to further personal goals, ask staff for more complete and understandable written justification for proposed board actions to eliminate the need for as much follow-up prior to meetings. This doesn't mean more lengthy documentation. Um, and then there were another, uh, other ones, too, that we'll be able to bring up as we come to the end. But at this point, let's go ahead and start going through um, the, the item questions from the questionnaire. And we'll start with number one. The board works to reach consensus on important matters. Um, there was a range of answers on this one uh, from strongly agree to disagree. Um, and interestingly, a lot of people seem to think that this was uh, either very important or important. So board member comments on this question. I guess I'll jump in. Um, 
I was looking at this one, and it, we do. It does seem like we have a fair. I mean, we do have in sense a, a consensus that it's at least uh, important. So I think it's the the idea behind it is that we. I don't know that I feel that we need to always reach consensus, but I think we should work to try to reach consensus if we can, because I think if we can arrive at a decision that we have all agreed to. It creates a much stronger foundation for that decision to be implemented. And so um, I don't necessarily take that to mean that we all, that we think everybody has to agree, but that we should, that we should at least work to reach a, a, a decision that we can, that we can all feel reasonably good about. And if we can't, we can't, but that should be our goal. Any other comments on this one? Bob? I agree wholeheartedly with Mrs. Cordero. Susan? Mm -hmm. um, well, I agree too, I, and I, I think it comes out in some of the other questions, but I don't think it's reasonable to expect we will always agree on everything. And that's why there's five of us, you know, so we have diverse um, perspectives and input. But I do also agree that when we do reach consensus, it is valuable because it does indeed, I think, help in the impl implementation of things. So sometimes we'll agree to disagree, but um, if there are opportunities for us to reach agreement, I think that's positive. And Ed? I would agree. I think very often we work very hard to get to consensus and, and often do. Mm -hmm. But if we don't, uh, I see no problem with that at all. And, and I agree with that also that um, what I see happening when we're working at our best is that we're bringing different viewpoints and different ideas to the table. And um, if we have enough time for a dialogue, um, and sometimes it needs to happen over multiple meetings, uh, we improve our decision if we've reached consensus because we've taken pieces of what everybody's ideas were and um, blended together for a stronger whole. Um, but obviously it's true that we can't always ag reach agreement and then, uh, you know, board majority is board majority. Um, but uh, it was good to see that so many people thought that this was important. Um, so uh, let's move on to number two. The board exercises effective oversight in regard to educational matters. And in this one, um, everybody agreed that this was very important. And um, I was pleased to see, too, that everybody either strongly agreed, most of us strongly agreed, uh, or agreed that we are doing a good job on this, uh, in this area. Any comments on this? Yes, Bob. Well, I can tell you, uh, uh, for me, I mean, uh, this did not, not, did not, this was not a general statement. This was mm -hmm. in regard to educational matters. Right. And, I, and uh, to make, would make a difference if that were more elaborated like you know into other possibilities other right. areas um, any other comments on it let's move on to number three the board uh, exercises effective oversight in regards to administrative manners and this had a big split here um, three were strongly agree and then two were either disagree or strongly disagree everybody felt that this was very important um, so uh, let's talk about this issue. Susan? I, I was curious how people defined administrative matters because to me that might have influenced, you know, a response. So I'd like to hear maybe what other board members, how they envision administrative matters. Anybody want to chime in on their thoughts on what That's sort of what, what I was. All right, so Bob. My comment was a minute ago. All right, so. You, you could refine this and refine this and refine this and then and get a lot more, probably a lot more spread in, in people's mm -hmm. judgments, but, you know, it's a short questionnaire. So what do you see as administrative matters? But my definition mm -hmm. of administrative matters? Well, there's a whole, whole range of administrative matters, ranging from personnel to uh, uh, facilities, in which case I would score one way and mm -hmm. uh, administrative matters, or maybe score two ways on that one. Mm -hmm. I'd, I didn't come prepared to e elaborate on what that. administrative matters meant, but, but if I think about it a bit, I can. Yeah, yeah, and and I honestly, I'm not sure. Um, um, I probably would have scored this more on the disagree side, uh, 
because I think that the board has so many responsibilities on its plate and that education is the number of one focus um, that sometimes uh, oversight on this on the sort of secondary administrative matters is something that we we are occasionally weak on Bob program administration mm -hmm. allocation of resources you know I, I think that uh, that in special ed uh, the board has not exercised adequate uh, uh, oversight through the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the data speak for themselves. But, uh. and, Susan? And to me, this really raises the, the question of how much can the board really know, you know, and, and how much, to what extent should we get involved in administrative matters? I mean, we can't be experts in all areas and all things. And, um, and to me, that's sometimes frustrating to be in a situation where I'm making decisions that I know I don't know as much as I potentially could know, um, you know, I, so it's it's a, it's difficult to know, you know, if you're actually implementing, you know, your what you're mandated to do, but you don't know that you know everything that you should know. Right. I mean, I think it's important for us to remember that we're at the policy level, um, and so mm -hmm. it's it's in terms of administrative policy. But at the same time, you have to have a lot of information in order to make good decisions about administ administrative policy, and sometimes, it, you know, there are holes. Annette? Well, I wanted to echo uh, Susan's comment as well, that there's a, I think there's a limit to how much oversight the board should try to exercise. I don't, m my belief is I don't think the board should get into micromanaging, um, so our administrators are charged with conducting the business of the district and we are at a policy level but I also agree that it requires us to to exercise d you know our due diligence and oversight because we should probably have been more on top of the special education issues um, <coughs> there are things that we need to be aware of but we also, I, I feel like we have to keep in mind that the, the administrators who are in place are the experts typically in that field, much more so than I feel I am. Um, even being an educator, I don't have, I don't have a special education degree. I don't have, you know, a background in finance. Um, so there are times at which I think we need to also be sure that we honor a and also take advantage of uh, the expertise that our administrators have that go beyond the expertise that most of us have. I mean, we are intentionally a lay board. So that means, you know, that means something. Yeah. Ed? Yeah. Uh, I don't look at the word oversight in the same way. I think awareness. Um, if there's a problem, we're going to be aware of it. I mean, I guarantee we'll be aware of it. And sometimes, and I see a huge change just in the short time I've been here in the administration keeping us informed as to what's going on administratively. And I don't look at that as oversight. It's just if you're talking out in the public and they bring it up, you want to know what's going on. And I think I see a huge change in that. I think there is an, a definite uh, desire to, to keep the board inf informed on, on little things that, yes, we're, we can't be involved in the details, but believe me, we hear about it. And to be able to say at least we know something about a topic, yeah. other than saying, hey, I have no idea what's going on. I mean, that's the worst position to be in. So it's not oversight, it's just awareness. And I think we're doing a much better job. Uh, I see at least a better job. Okay, let's move on to. I, I have oh, yes, Bob. More thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, uh, I mean, this is kind of a, a central and enduring problem in governance. Uh, legislative bodies always have a problem exercising. They have oversight re responsibilities, but they lack expertise, and it's just it's true wherever you go, at the at the highest levels of government, whether there's money, you know, whether it's at the state level or, or even the county level. There's a, legislators have staff who can dig and get information and so on. Uh, you have the Congressional Budget Office. Why? Because Congress wants independent information. They, they're dependent upon the uh, administration. No, they want their own. Uh, so it's, it's a dilemma. And, and, and at this level, in a small agency like this, uh, it, 
I, I don't know that there's a definitive resolution to it. I think it's always going to be a, a kind of a tension. Uh, something's going on. How are you going to find out more? Uh, you go sticking sticking your nose into into administrative business, and you and people get irritated, and then you say, you know. Butt out. And the, fortunately, we have very polite people who never say butt out. You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but sometimes they it. probably should say butt out. <laughs> yes. uh, so, and, and so it's a, it's a real dilemma. Uh, how, how do you get that information? Uh, is, 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 I have to look at Dr. Sarver. It's not an insult to say that the information we're getting uh, from the administration has a perspective to it. It's just a reality. And there are other perspectives. Our job, in my opinion, oversight means understanding what's going on, and, and sometimes it requires a lot of digging to get independent information. And it's just, it, it's part of the job. It's just, it's a tension that will never be definitively resolved. Any other comments on that one? Um, number four, the board ensures accountability. Um, again, uh, quite important to board members. Um, sort of a middle range on this one. Agreed, disagreed. Any comments on this one? Susan, uh, sorry, Annette. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, it was Annette. Well, I was, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not even, I don't even quite remember which one I put there. Um, I didn't look back at, at this particular one. That's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I looked at m most of them. I don't. I don't remember looking at this one, but um, but I think the issue for me was which whichever one I put. And I, I think I I probably said agree, um, but the issue was I'm. I feel like I I would like to have more information about how we can hold or how we can um, require and assure ensure accountability. Because I I don't I think in many in many areas we do a, a very fine job, and then occa occasionally, but these are the ones that usually pop up and become pro big problems. We don't do a sufficient job, and sometimes, especially as we have been, you know, for the last several years, not just these last couple of years where the budget has been really bad, but you know, starting some time ago we started really cutting back uh, district office personnel. And as we've done that, I think to some extent there's been less and less accountability because people have so much on their plates. So I'm interested in trying, because clearly we were, I mean, we weren't saying we strongly agree that we do this. I'm interested in, in how can we uh, ensure accountability in a way that is reasonable for people who have huge amounts of duties on their plate and yet still give us the sort of um, reassurance that we need that things are being done the way that they should be done. So for me it's, it's a little bit more of a question, you know, how can we do this? Any other comments? Well, and I would jump in on that. Um, that when oh. decisions are made, you know, we, we're, we're always looking at the next problem, the next decision, and we don't always come back and reevaluate things that we've discussed and made decisions about. Um, and, and so this idea of, of follow through, and again, I understand with staffing that sometimes is difficult, but maybe there's a way to institutionalize um, a more regular return update to areas of concern. Um, I know sometimes when we're out in the public, people will tell us things and we'll say, well, we thought that was fixed, you know, why, why am I hearing about this X problem, you know, and, um, and I know it involves so many layers, you know, when we make a decision, it has to go down so far to be implemented, but maybe there is a way to structure, um, you know, a revisit to, to certain decision-making um, exercises so that we, we feel that there is more accountability back to us. I think I answered this from disagree. I was the same as Annette. I was going through trying to figure out which ones I answered. And I think I did it because of a perception and maybe not reality to some degree, but I answered it from the standpoint of the public. I think the public does not think 
we hold things and, and, and follow through and keep things accountable. And so I think it's a public thing um, where somehow we have to change the idea that uh, things just aren't happening or people aren't being held accountable or issues aren't accountable. And I think it's a long-term process. But I think the public doesn't feel we hold people accountable. And I think the public is the most important. Um, so do you think that maybe if uh, Susan's suggestion of revisiting um, issues, maybe even in a board brief? I mean, there's some things that we specifically ask for reports on, and we get them. Right. Um, in a way, though, when it's in a board brief, um, the, the public doesn't see that. Um, so uh, I think that that and would having be... Having it on the web yeah. is, is a big step. Forward. That That is yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I but really maybe like highlighting, uh, some, if there's some way of highlighting that the board mm -hmm. has gotten a report on a specific mm -hmm. issue. Right. Well, and, and, and just to, to dovetail on what Ed said, I mean, I think I certainly feel the need, and I've heard other board members um, describe a need for maybe a better communication to the public, better mechanisms, more volume, whatever, and um, and maybe that's a way to show the public, you know, that, that things are being done. Is When you talk about accountability to them, maybe we need to do a better job of informing people about how, in fact, we have addressed problems. Okay, moving on to number five. Our board explicitly examines the downside or possible pitfalls of any important decision it is about to make. Um, this ranged from strongly agree, most either strongly agreed or, or agreed. There was one disagree. Any comments on this one? All right. Um, I, say, I think the numbers kind of, you know, sort of speak for themselves. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that yeah. there's much to say about that. Okay. Um, number six, the board often questions administrative proposals requiring the superintendent to reconsider the recommendations. Um, there's a strongly agree, a couple of agrees, and then a couple of disagrees. Um, this one was also... Uh, less important uh, for board members than some of the other ones that we've seen. In fact, one person felt, felt that this was really not uh, not very important, let's put it that way, down at, at a one. Um, any comments on this one? Well, I, 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 I don't remember what I put on this, but, uh, but you know, it really depends on the nature. I mean, so much of the stuff is routine, mm -hmm. you know, and then then there's something like a little less than routine, and you know you, you have a continuum there, and uh, 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 makes a big difference which which end of the continuum right one is at and how one answers this. Well, I think that the key word there was often, um, yeah. and I think the reality yeah. is, is is not very often, That's but it, right. it, exactly. it feels like it's a lot when we do it because it it has a. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> Brian is going, <laughs> um, but uh, you know it's 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 certainly uh, more controversial when we when we asked for reconsideration, uh, right. Susan. When, and I would just say um, that I think when we do ask Brian to reconsider things, he does. I mean, so you know that to mm -hmm. my mind that that's that's positive. At least we have that mechanism to say, well, we're mm -hmm. not so sure about this. Let's let's maybe approach it from a different angle. I always sense there's a willingness you know, to uh, work with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Had 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 Susan and I put in requesting the superintendent, the answers would have been been different too. We don't require the superintendent to do very much using that kind of language. Yeah. And I've I've put in things like let's instruct the superintendent. And everybody goes ah, slash instruct. I mean, we don't do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but we do frequently ask for more information, and we and we always get it. Mm -hmm. Ed, I think the fact that we question some of the recommendations is good. Heaven forbid we would approve every single thing that came across our desk. I can see what the ramifications of that would be. And so I don't think we asked to reconsider the, the recommendation itself. Maybe the wording, the content, uh, some of the way it's formulated, uh, maybe more information. But I don't think that's bad at all. Yeah. And Ed? Right. I, I kind of agree with probably the word requiring may, may not be exactly what we actually do. Um, that the board often questions administrative proposals 
you know, leading to the superintendent reconsidering the recommendations because often it's a it's sort of um, a collective decision to say, oh, yeah, maybe we should go in this direction instead or maybe we should tweak it this way. Um, I was interested that one person said that that wasn't important or, you know, ranked it very, of very little importance. But now that I'm hearing people say, well, it's, if you're thinking about it in terms of just the routine, I'm thinking like things on the consent agenda, um, then that would make sense to me. Um, so I, maybe it's that often that was, because I think when we do it, it's very important. But maybe it's that often that, um, yeah, we don't do it on every single item and that it would be, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We'd never have never ending meetings if we did. Yeah. Let's move on to number seven. The board is proactive with respect to problems and issues that arise. There were two agrees on this, but three disagrees. And this is, uh, uh, I actually was surprised on this one that not everybody ranked that as a four because I think that this is extremely important, but a lot of people thought it was just important. Um, any comments on this one? I think goes, uh, in some sense it goes back to the in information problem that, uh, you know, how, do, how can you be proactive when you don't have a lot of information about what, uh, what's uh, going on, but only a piece of it. Any other comments on it? Susan? Oh. I, was, I think I agree with that, that um, I think when we know about problems, you know, we're all very willing to act upon them, but there are times when things kind of come out of the blue um, that we don't know about, and, and so therefore, it appears that, that we're not being active, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's probably not because we don't want to be, it's just because we don't know about the issues. And I, I guess that's the bigger question is how much can we know? I mean, how much can we know the landscape so completely that we can anticipate every problem? I mean, it would be nice to, to do a better job on that, but I don't know how. Any other, Ed? No, I think it's very hard to be proactive in the, in the environment we have. Um, so much is administrative that never gets to us. Mm -hmm. And so we hear about things, but they never get to our level, and yet they're out there. And it's very hard um, to discuss those things at, a board, at the board level. You can't just all of a sudden start talking about something. You know, it, it takes a, an effort to get it on the agenda, and it has to be, you know, it's just not a, a routine kind of thing that you'd like to have the board know about. So I think, you know, I think it's just hard to be proactive. I, I answered that one agree, um, so I think we do a good job, but I can see why there'd be disagree disagreement from the fact that it's hard to be proactive. Annette? Well, I also think that it's hard to be proactive to problems and issues when, it, as the, it's worded here, problems and issues when they arise. When problems and issues arise, you are almost by definition being reactive. Um, so I think we do, you know, a reasonably good job of responding to those. But to me, it seems like being the, the proactive aspect would be not in addressing the problems, in addressing things that we have identified ourselves and said, here, here are places where we think we could get out in front of the problems. So to me, it seems like once the problem is there, you're, react you're not being proactive, you're reacting. Um, so I, I think we do a reasonably good job of, of responding to them, but I'm not sure I would call that proactive. Um, for me, I feel like the board doesn't do enough reflection on areas of uh, possible problems, um, and that's why, uh, yes, once you once the problem, a critical problem is right in front of you, you're, you're reactive. But and I'll use uh, a couple of examples. One is special ed, where we knew that there was a lot of turnover going on over a number of years and it was almost predictable that at some point it was going to hit a crisis because there was so much turnover and there was not direction coming from the district office and i feel like we could have you know a year earlier said wow this is you know we're at uh, number six on the list in terms of directors and uh what are things we could have at, at a conference level said where do we think there might be problems uh, over the next year? Or even when, when we knew that we were hiring, you know, doing that um, 
before the hiring process was completed. Um, another issue, for example, is facilities, where we know that there's an issue with the Department of State architect. And there are things going on or not happening in our schools because of issues with the state. Um, but we don't communicate that effectively to the public, I think. And, um, and so when a problem arises, uh, again, we're reactive, we're defensive. Um, and, and this is where I really think we have a board weakness in terms of looking ahead um, at where we're likely to have problems. Annette? Well, I, I completely agree with you. And I think it, it, this is a great opportunity because we usually don't have this opportunity in a regular board meeting um, to have the kind of conversation about, because when we looked at special ed, you know, two, three, four years ago, we, you were, you're right, we saw this coming. I mean, we knew that there were problems that we kept talking about, we have to clean up special ed. Um, and so the issue is, or for me, is that we, di we, knew, we did see it, we did anticipate it, we sort of recognized that we needed to do something, and so what was the, what was the process, or what was the, the structure, um, how did we, how did we get derailed, I guess is my question. Recognizing it was one thing, and then being actually accomplishing, doing something about it, is a different thing Absolutely. and so how did we get what was the obstacle to getting from recognizing it to addressing it because you're right the department of state architect is one that we're i think we're you know we're in right now mm -hmm. we are in that i think we're in that position where we see that it's a problem and could potentially become a serious problem mm -hmm. how what how are we going to avoid that same obstacle that derailed us in the special ed issue about accomplishing what we, something, trying to address it before it becomes bigger with this issue. Mm -hmm. So what was it that, so I guess I, I wanna know what was the obstacle so we know how to avoid it for right. this issue. And I don't, I don't know exactly what the yeah. obstacle was because we, I think, and, and I would look to, to Robin and to Brian, I think we, not only the board, we pretty much, we all, we all knew this, and not only administrator, the board knew it. Mm -hmm. um, so how did we not do anything so we can avoid that path again? I actually think this interestingly ties back to Susan's discussion about accountability, mm -hmm. um, where it would be nice to go back and reflect on, on uh, how we reacted to certain reports that the board got um, or how we didn't react mm -hmm. um, to sort of tie it into accountability when we have uh, foreseeable problems that are coming to us. Since, uh, may, yep. may, may I just step in? Yep, yep. Since, since uh, you brought that up and, and mentioned our involvement in that, uh, something like the Department of State Architect is uh, something that that we've been bringing to the board for 10 years now. I mean, it's been an ongoing problem. It's slowed down every project and it has across the state. And I frankly don't know what the board's role is in a process like that. Uh, at one point, we did go outside of the process, and I think it was the Santa Barbara High School pool. Uh, we went to Jack O'Connell. We said, uh, can't you step in? Now, this is actually before I was superintendent, so you know it was over five years ago. We said, can't you step in? Uh, we've got a big problem here. We're not getting this project approved. Costs are escalating. We're going to be in trouble on this. And that was a case where the, uh, the issue then was pulled from the Department of State Architect. It went to an independent firm. Uh, Jack O'Connell was very helpful to us, but the repercussions were severe. It slowed down every other project in the district and we got a lot more comments from the Department of State Architect that we had to address on all of our other projects, so. Yeah, and so, I wanna be careful uh, that we don't go into too many yeah. uh, specifics on these things because we could have a yeah. whole conversation around but, that. But you had also mentioned special mm -hmm. education. Yeah. Uh, it was two years ago that I came to the board and I realized it was a different board uh, but I came to the board and I said, look, this position is underpaid. Now, we had someone who had been in place for about a year and a half. And I'm sorry, Brian, I'm going to stop you on that because I want to be sure that we stay 
on the topic of the board self-evaluation. Well, I thought we were going back over examples. Well, okay. yeah, but I don't want to go into details. Here's just a, a couple of quick examples when you're talking about okay. um, uh, uh, problems that we may have been able to, to react differently to at the board, and not necessarily administration, yeah. mm -hmm. but at the board level. Because my, my uh, concern is that we did, the board did get that information. We did know about this, and we, yeah, I, I think one of my, my comments about administration was that I, I think this was pretty generally felt, and certainly the board knew about it. Mm -hmm. So now, given that we have other areas where we can anticipate, um, we have gotten information from, from the administration. We do know that there are places where we have some concerns. How can we avoid our lack of effective response that we, that we sort of fell prey to mm -hmm. um, with the special ed uh, issues because I, my concern was about us. Mm -hmm. we, we knew this as mm -hmm. a board and we didn't effectively address it. Mm -hmm. So how can we do that now? Bob? I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about uh, other things. What about problems that are just long-term and chronic? I'm not thinking particularly about the achievement gap, the lack of of participation by minorities in higher level classes. And, you know, we see the data and, and they're, you know, we, we understand that. Uh, we've been proactive in the sense we have a focus goals. We, you know, we've, we've done all the right things. Uh, but is there more? Uh, and, and this gets me to my, my point is simply maybe where we're not being proactive, and that's probably the wrong word, has to do with follow through on implementation that we don't, we don't ask for implementation reports. And that you know, doesn't mean results. That says, uh, how's, how's it go that you, the best program in the world can't do a damn thing if it's not implemented? Fidel, that's the word. Fidelity of implementation, is that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe, we should, maybe we could be more proactive there. And I'm think, uh, I thought Ed was, uh, he, on the special ed thing, he asked for a report at every meeting on the on the implementation of FICMAT. Uh, now that's that's pretty hard line there, Mr. Heron, but uh, <laughs> you got a five zero vote on that. Uh, but uh, but some kind of follow through, to, uh, you know, to, and, and I, I don't have I'd have to think it through, and I'd leave it to you folks to. Uh. Mm -hmm. Ed, I'll use another example. It's current is the Read 180. I mean, we have a huge yeah. investment in that, mm -hmm. and yet I have an email that says. I don't know, three, four schools haven't even requested um, the technology to hook up. Now, maybe they don't need it. They don't need it. They don't need it. But it doesn't say that. It just mm -hmm. says they haven't done it. So it leaves, for me, it leaves it, why haven't they? Mm -hmm. it, you know, why haven't they? But the follow-up to make sure that that program works. And I think that um, the more we are involved just letting people know that, hey, we want this to succeed, what you need to make it succeed will solve some of these problems. I don't want to sit here a year from now and hear a report, oh, it didn't work. And we sit here and say, why not? Yeah. You know, yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the READ 180 is a prime example of how we can follow through to show our support um, and be kept aware of how it's going. And so far, you know, I appreciate the updates on the technology aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Susan. Um, relating to what Bob said, I would love to see the energy that we've devoted to special education in the last six months be put into the achievement gap and these issues of, of um, our Latino students being more represented in the, the higher level classes. And I think if, I mean, we've shown that if we, you know, put the money and the willpower and the staffing into a problem, we have a really good chance of fixing that problem. And I, sometimes, and I know we're going to get to this probably in some of these later questions, but I feel we're so overwhelmed with all this other stuff that we, we lose track of what's our most important goal. And so I, would love to see some streamlining, um, and again, it addresses this later, of, of maybe there's some things we can let go of so that we could focus on those things that we really think are more important and put more resources into those. Okay. Um, moving on to number eight, the board ensures that the variety of values and perspectives in our diverse community are reflected in the policy process. Um, most agree. There were certainly some disagree and strongly disagree. Everybody did agree that this was very important. Um, any comments on this one? Annette? Well, um, I disagree with this um, because, for example, 
Um, we still don't have our board meetings televised in Spanish. We, I think, offer a very unwelcoming environment for non-native, for non-English speakers. Um, I, many times, and probably other people have witnessed this too, we know that we have an interpreter who sits in the back of the room. The people who, for whom she's interpreting usually have to sit in the back of the room with her. Um, I've seen them because a lot of the other people who attend don't necessarily know what's going on. Um, they sometimes get not so pleasant looks from people who think they're just chatting um, or feel like they're being, you know, they're talking and disrupting their, annoying them. We've had ongoing concerns about getting all of our materials on the web in Spanish. Um, we have done, we now are a lot better. I do want to give a lot of credit to Barbara and others who were, have been responsible for that. Um, we are certainly a lot better than we used to be. Um, but we still don't have everything in Spanish that we have in English. Um, I'm not sure how far we've gotten with holding gate meetings in Spanish. Um, I just think there's a lot of areas where we still uh, don't, don't do very well. Um, if I were a non-English speaking parent, I, I think I would know that I can participate. I don't think I would feel that it was easy to do, and I'm not sure that I would feel that it was very comfortable to do. So I, I think we really need to address a lot, a lot of these issues a lot more. I agree with you. I think this is just an ongoing challenge, and we just need to get better. Um, Bob? Or no, please. Susan? The ELAC manual that we just saw, that seems like a great opportunity to come back to this, you know, mm -hmm. and say, how many ELAC committees have been formed or robust or, you know, mm -hmm. are developing leaders that then, you know, participate in the other organizations? So that would be a good place to. Yeah, Bob. Uh, the word reflected is, for me, the operative word because reflected in means that not only do we hear, but that we do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's politics. That's politics. Uh, uh, we're somehow we we are we are, in my opinion, are not influenced enough in our decision making by the problems and by our understandings of the of the minority community, disadvantaged kids, and so on. Uh, they're not effective lobbyists compared to a number that I won't mention, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, I, you, I'm sure there'd be differences on this, but one, from, from my point of view, one of our, if we really take it seriously, then we would do something to help them mobilize so that we do get not just co communication, but effective political communication. We're here, look at our numbers. Uh, we're responsible, we're, we're, we're asking for something, uh, just like we get all the time from the various uh, uh, groups and constituencies in, in, the, in the political body. Uh, I don't know whether we could do that or not, but uh, it's empowering. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We need an empowered, disadvantaged and Latino constituency. We're deprived of that input, and that's a serious problem. Yes. Um, number nine, the board models and reinforces respect for cultural and intellectual diversity. This had a range of three that agreed and two that strongly disagreed on. Any comments on this one? It sort of speaks for itself. We have work to do in that. <laughs> All right, number 10, the board agenda facilitates effective and efficient decision making. A couple agreed, but it was mostly strong, uh, disagree and strongly disagree on this one. Um, so this says to me that we need to work on our uh, agenda. Any comments on uh, how uh, you would like the board to address uh, making some changes to the agenda? Annette? Well, I was just going to su suggest that, that I think that's a conversation that we need to have. We need to agree as a board because I think too often we just leave it to the president and the superintendent to develop the 
the agenda. And then if we don't like it, we criticize how that mm -hmm. was done. Um, but we don't really, we haven't ever really had a discussion as far as I can recall in my term on the board um, about what we think an agenda should do. Um, there are lots of ways that you can handle an agenda. We can, we can set time limits and we can actually adhere to them. And we can say, okay, there's going to be 20 minutes for this item. At the end of 20 minutes, we're leaving this item no matter what. Or we have to vote to take that time away from something else. Mm -hmm. um, so we can be really rigid and strict about it. Um, we can agree that we just want to let it be a f you know, free-flowing thing and mm -hmm. stay here till midnight like we did the other night. Mm -hmm. um, we could limit, you know, the time. I, we, we could adhere, you know, more closely to Robert's Rules of Order and say, okay, nobody gets to speak until everyone else is, and nobody gets to speak again until everybody else right. has had a chance to speak. We could put, even put lim time limits on what, how many, how long the board could speak. Um, you know, we can, there are all kinds of things we can do, but we can't, I don't think we can just say, you handle it. Mm -hmm. You make our agenda better. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to decide as a, as a board, you know, how strict do we want to be? How loose do we want to be? How long do we want to go? Um, do we want to have more meetings and limit the agenda um, for each meeting? Do mm -hmm. we want to have longer meetings? Um, how do we want to yeah. deal with that? And and that's agenda procedure, but I, we could also completely just change the agenda. Yeah. There are, there are um, different models out there. Susan? Um, well, my, if, if in the range of um, suggestions Annette is making, my preference would be to have less things on the agenda mm -hmm. because I think we do like to de delve into them more fully and I think we'd get more benefit um, in some of the areas that we consider really important if we could spend more time with them. So, you know, I'm not sure. I guess I need to know, does everything that's on the agenda absolutely have to come before the board legally? Is that right? I mean, a lot of the consent agenda things? Everything on the consent does, um, but uh, the, the place where you don't necessarily need things is on the conference agenda. And mm -hmm. there are lots of boards that don't do, that don't have conversations around, um, you know, updates on this educational program or that educational program. Um, and they really limit it to a consent agenda item and an and action. Mm -hmm. And then their conference agenda item is very, very limited. Um, that's a direction that we could go yeah. in. Well, actually, I, I think the conference agenda is where we <laughs> we had, would accomplish those things that we've already addressed. That's as where being you can be proactive. Prob problem areas, <laughs> yeah. Um. But almost, uh, unless it's something that's coming back to us for action, um, well, and I'll say, here's an example, is the DLAC. That was a great manual uh, for us to look at. It could completely have come to us as a board brief. Um, but I also think it's important for us to have these conversations. So. Bob? Uh, just in, in looking at things for other, on other tasks, I repeatedly find school boards that have, at the, at the beginning, adoption of the agenda. And I'm just wondering whether if that became a habit, it would it'd be an occasion for a conversation about the agenda, uh, an occasion for allocating time, uh, and for, for it to become a more of a, a corporate uh, ent uh, product. The, the only issue that I could see with that would be, in California, be Brown Act issues around you've, you've noticed people that something's going to be on the agenda and what time it's going to be or roughly what time. Well, I don't know what the rules are on that. I would, you know, once it's published, it's published. And I, I, don't, I don't understand how, how that works. But, I mean, it's, it's very widespread practice. There mm -hmm. must be some accommodation between the need for advanced publication and the, and the ability to, to put a whole new, you know, put stuff on there without advance notice and the idea of adopting the agenda. I don't, does anyone have any experience in that? No, but we could certainly. Do. Yeah. do you? How does that work? I do. I, I, and I've sat for years in boards that do adopt the agenda. Uh -huh. What you end up with is a room filled with people who sit for the night waiting for their items. And that's specifically what we've tried to avoid by putting times on them. Uh -huh. So. So at the beginning of the meeting, the board will take a look at a proposed agenda, for example. They'll say, well, let's move this item here, let's move this item, and we'll take this item, and, and the board will make those decisions. They'll decide which of those consent items would be moved, and, and in fact, that's part of adopting the agenda, which of those need to be discussed. 
And what happens is that staff and public uh, fill the room and then leave and come back two hours later. Or, you know, you, there isn't very much advance notice in a system like that. Susan? This is something that, that I've thought about, too. Um, certainly, we as board members have the opportunity to make phone calls after Friday afternoon <laughs> before Tuesday night um, or send emails to get more information about some of the items that we might want clarification on. And, and sometimes that then precludes the necessity to, say, pull a, a, a consent agenda item. So I would like to just you know, make sure that the board takes full advantage of those opportunities. On the other hand, sometimes there are times when um, what is written is confusing to me, and um, and I don't know if it's just me, <laughs> but um, it, it would be my hope that, that sometimes some of the documentation that comes with some of the material we get is, is a little more clear so that, that we can process it. Um, I, I remember particularly, and this, was, this wasn't necessarily a clarification, but we got the job descriptions of the new nurses and there was one other um, counselors, or there was one other thing. And, and I, first, I thought it had to do be with, um, we had changed those descriptions and I called Chris and she said, no, 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 you know, this is just um, a brand new description and, and Bob actually pulled that item because he wasn't clear on what it was about and so those were two people who didn't really understand exactly what that information was there for and, and so um, I guess it's just a long-winded way of saying, you know, it would be helpful to have sometimes a little bit more clear information that comes with these items that might preclude us from pulling them, but also we can always call, and I'd like to encourage all board members to do that, take advantage of that as well. Bob? Uh, I, I, I just really a question to Brian. Uh, uh, I, I never read my agenda on Friday night. Okay? Friday is a family time, okay? Uh, so, so I can't start asking questions until Monday. Uh, is it out of the question that we could like get the agenda Friday morning? <laughs> that give so I that, that give us time to come down and answer a lot of questions on the pulled items, or you know, get on the phone and 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 maybe shorten the process a bit. Uh, I see a smile. That, was well, that, well, that, I'm, I'm that a smile in, in affirmation? Well, <laughs> I had to restructure the office to be able to get it out early Friday rather <laughs> than Friday at seven. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that electronically we could get just the agenda out. That's almost always completed by Thursday. Or consent? Con I mean, are, are parts of it uh, more it, readily it, available it still than others? It changes on Friday morning. Yeah. We have enough changes that it does change. Uh, or, and we can work to, to move it up to get it to you earlier. Well, some of it. I mean, how, I, I didn't hear the answer. Uh, what about the consent? Is, uh, aren't, aren't some of those are fairly routine things? And in fact, those are some of the things that come in at the last minute. Oh, really? And, and typically, I decide that rather than wait for another two weeks, most of those items come to us, and there might be a change order or something like that. We still have time to get it on the agenda, so we'll let it go through, and uh -huh. it gets entered by Friday morning. But there's a backup on that, which is that if you make very many changes, then you run into the translation problem because it does have to be translated in Spanish. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, well, in fact, for staff, we say, look, by Tuesday, middle of the day, by Tuesday, we need to know what titles you anticipate and how much time you anticipate. Then we build on that and we give them another uh, day and a half to get the backup materials to us, but there are changes. There are invariably changes. Maybe something needs to go to to uh, legal counsel um, or any number of things. I, I just uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, quickly. This is kind of elaborating on something Annette was uh, concerned she addressed earlier. Can we, if we're going to have, can we post this agenda other, like at the East Side Center and at the West Side Center? Uh, I'm thinking particularly of the, of the Spanish language version of it. And, uh, if, it may take quite a while to get the public accustomed to it, but uh, you know, it's a long way down here. <laughs> you know. Seems like something that we could ask if they'd be, uh, if it's possible to post it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Could. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Perhaps we could even just send it over to the center electronically. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the English, here's the Spanish. Make it available. And let them post it. 
Yeah. I don't know whether they'd want to post it, but I mean, it does take some wall space to do that. Well, I bet they'd be cooperative. Mm -hmm. Annette? Yeah, I was thinking, I don't know if our schools post it. Um, I think it would better. also no, you'd, you'd be helpful to have posted. it they, posted at the school sites. They could just put, and they could just, because they do post them in the teachers' lounges. That's a lot yeah. better idea than mine. Um, but they, because I think you could, you could, just, you know, like staple. most of us do, just staple it and post it. You don't have to mm -hmm. take the whole yeah. space to have every page. Um, or simply just on the on the um, office counter. Uh, some schools yeah. don't have places to post yeah. for parents, but I, I think that, that could be because helpful. that way um, we could just have you know a, a school one of the school staff be responsible for just making sure that it gets put up somewhere. It gets printed and put mm -hmm. up. Yeah, which yeah. would you know, be minimal amount of time. Um, the other thing I was going to suggest is if you, for Bob, if you don't um, have, if you don't read the agenda on Friday, um, I know that not all of our staff are available over the weekend, but lots of them are because I email people on the weekend and I get, you know, <laughs> emails back at, on Saturday at, you know, 1030 at night or something. So if, I mean, some of those we could, I think we could at least email early. They, even if they don't get it until Monday, mm, at least mm, they'll get mm. it early Monday. I mm. mean, um, it, it would preclude you from having necessarily to make a trip down, or if you did come, they would be prepared for, with the answer mm -hmm. rather than having to wait until you, yeah, you come to heard. ask it. Yeah. I always wait until Monday morning. Mm -hmm. People answer over the weekend? Yeah, when the so moment is, when, when, yeah. when the moment is right, it's right. Yeah. And, uh, they do yeah. it. And uh, I, I have to start. I, I email when I have the urge to email, and it dawns on me that's not good because I get responses. And so that means, <laughs> then, that means somebody else is working when they, you know, so I have to think twice before I email, but if I don't, I forget. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, All right. Um, I, I would like to say, oh, yes, um, you know, what I'm very pleased with is that the agenda and the attachments are on the websites on Friday. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to see anything changed to stop that. Uh, but the agenda usually is up there early, you know, early afternoon. Uh, if you have a vicious dog, you can come down here at two o'clock and pick up your own. <laughs> you know, so I'm fortunate. I get mine at two o'clock because I pick it up. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I applaud the fact that it is out on the website Tuesday after or Friday afternoon, uh, so it is available. And uh, the attachments are attachment, also done. They have been they for used quite to a while. Not until Monday. Yeah, they now they're speak. on Friday afternoon, so it's. Uh, don't do anything to change that. <laughs> and have we and have we clarified that issue about what is an attachment and you know and what and what can be held back until you know what's her name uh, Carolyn Renard's issue. Right. Yeah, have we clarified that? Okay. The, the agenda is the is the list of items. Right. That's the agenda. Okay. And and the attachments are not integral to it, and therefore could come at a different could come after the 72 hours? The attachments yeah. can come later. However, if we send attachments out, we also make it available to the yeah. public. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, w uh, I would really like to get through this whole list. And yeah. so what I'm going to do is the ones that I see that are less important to people, I'm just going to read those off. And if you want to chime in with comments, let me know. So uh, the next two, 11 and 12, were both less important to the board. One was most board members tend to rely on observation and informal discussions to learn about their roles and responsibilities. And number 12 was this board's decisions usually result in a split vote. Um, most people disagreed with that and also didn't really feel that it was uh, important. I think that uh, we get publicity about our split votes, but the reality is that the majority of votes really aren't split. Um, then there was number 13. When faced with important issues, the board often brainstorms and tries to find creative approaches or solutions to problems. That sort of ties back in with number one. The board works to reach consensus on important matters. Any comments on this one? Cool. Annette? Um, I didn't see this one so much as an issue of um, consensus as much as, for me, it was more of an issue of time. Like, we often don't have the opportunity because of the constraints of the Brown Act or the time to actually brainstorm and come up with creative responses. So for me, it wasn't really about whether we 
would would want to or whether we could do it effectively is that our structure just doesn't really um, support it very well. Ed? I agree totally with Annette. <laughs> and so would I. <laughs> All right, let's move on to number 14. At our board meetings, there's at least as much dialogue among members as there is between members, among members as there is between members and administrators. Again, this was not something, it was important. Um, there's a range on it, most agreed. Uh, number 15, um, some board members usually vote together for or against particular issues. Again, there was a range from a, a strongly agree to disagree, but again, people didn't really feel that that was terribly important. Ed? I have one comment on that, and, and I don't know if it exists or not, but sometimes I have a feeling that there are, are two members of the board, and never the same two members, but that sort of are involved in the process. And so some of the issues come here with two votes, and so you're only looking for one vote. And I can't put my hands on anything. I don't know what it is. I just ha sometimes have that feeling, um, and that relates to this one, I think, um, that um, I'd like to know on issues, if in fact two board members helped create the document, I'd like to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on it? Um, number 16, uh, the board often requests that a decision be postponed until further information can be obtained. Um, most people didn't think this was very important, um, and most people do. I personally think it's a positive thing if you uh, request, if you need further information that you get it. Um, I guess the key here would be often, um, because you'd want to, you'd want to be in a situation where you get, uh, the information in the first place. Um, number 17, our board meetings tend to focus more on current concerns than on preparing for the future. And that was, everybody, uh, thought this was important and either strongly agreed or agreed on this. And this ties back, I think, to what we already talked about in terms of being proactive. Um, any further comments on it? Well, it's a little different than being mm -hmm. proactive, but it's certainly related. Uh, we we could have visioning session, sec, uh, sessions. Uh, you know, we do a little of that. At, uh, certainly, we're going to be doing it in the, the next agenda item uh, to some extent. But uh, there, they could be more frequent. Where we're saying, okay, what, what where, 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 where do we want to be, and you know, try to develop some. Consensus if we can and mm -hmm. just and if we can't so be it at least you have a good airing of, it, of issues About the future mm -hmm. Ed? Oh, well, I think you know we our strategic plan is 10 years mm -hmm. out, Our strategic plan is 10 years out of date That would be one area where yeah. this question would come into play totally if we spent some time on a, revising the strategic plan um, Now we're moving on to oh, oh sorry Anna. I just wanted to say um, that I think this is actually more related to our issue about the agenda building mm. than um, consensus or other things because I think part of it has to do with which items we place on the agenda and how much time we give them. So for me, it goes back to deciding what do we want on the agenda what do we not want on the agenda? Gotcha. Uh, number 18, the board often requests ad additional information before making a decision. This was the one item that we all agreed on, uh, which was that we agreed, uh, that, and that it was, uh, for the most part, important, very important or important. Um, but again, that ties back up to 16. Um, I don't know if any comments on that, or we can move ahead to uh, number 19. And at this point, we're at the, uh, we have about this amount of time allotted for the discussion, but I would like to get through this, but I don't know what your, uh, your availability is this morning, if we can go ahead and, and get through those last 10 or so questions. Is that okay? Okay. 18, uh, I'm sorry, 19. I've never received feedback from fellow board members on my performance as a board member. Uh, and most people agreed or strongly agreed that they have not, uh, and this is hard. This is a hard one. Um, well, it, it didn't specify whether we're talking about verbal or nonverbal. It doesn't, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all get the nonverbal. 
<laughs> we get the nonverbal feedback, sure. But. You know, as a, as a new board member, this is something that would, I would feel is really important. It's really beneficial because sometimes you feel like you're just kind of learning on your feet and um, you don't go to board member school. I mean, maybe there's some opportunities for professional development, but still, it would. I think it, it would be helpful, um, and I'm not sure how what form it takes, whether it's just informal conversations. Um, I mean, I think we're all able to take criticism if, you know, if it, it's in that form, but also, you know, positive feedback and saying, oh, you know, that was well done or something. But it, it would be helpful for me just to know how to do my job better, I think. Annette? Well, you know, in higher ed, we evaluate our peers. So, um, this, and it is hard. It's very difficult. And it's extremely difficult to say anything critical. Um, so in this, in, in, in this position, I think it's even more so. So I'm wondering if, but I agree that it's really important and would be very helpful. And I know as when I was a new board member, I kind of wondered, am I doing, am I doing this right? Am I, you know? So I'm, I was trying to think of how we could do that without creating any kind of you know, tension among board members. And I'm wondering if, it, if there might be a way of just, you know, examining what different people do well so that we can see kind of what a model of, a, you know, a good board member would be. So we could say, well, this person, you know, Kate does this part really great. She, she you know, we could all kind of take a lesson from her on that. Um, Ed does this part really great. You know, he could be our model for that. So just kind of identify the the things that because I may not even know that you guys are doing that I thought, oh yeah I, that would be a good idea mm -hmm. um, so that I think that might be a way of, of addressing it where it wouldn't be contentious or or uncomfortable Ed? Uh, I found one easy way was I simply asked uh, <laughs> yes, you did. how am I doing yeah. and uh, you know and I've had conversations with uh, several board members uh, about that topic of uh, mixed into other topics, but just what's going on? How am I doing? What you know? What what could I do different or better or not do at all? So I think the more we communicate with each other in a very legal way, yes, um, uh, that you you can get that personal right. feedback. Right. And so um, I think the the fact that just at some time just ask somebody, you know, ask a fellow board member, right. how's it going? What am I doing? Yeah, as long as we keep it on topics that are around behaviors at, 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 rather than issues. Um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's hard to open yourself up to that, but I think it's a really good idea for us to, to um, say, ask for honest feedback, Annette. I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I think that's great, and I agree that Ed has done it. Um, but I also think that there may need to be a little bit more systematic mm -hmm. approach um, as well, not in not instead of. I mean, I think you can mm -hmm. have a, the informal and the formal. Um, but I think rather than relying on, first of all, you have to rely on the personality of the person to get the information. Then you have to rely on the personality of the other board members to respond, you know, accurately and mm -hmm. honestly. So I think if we could also have a little, something that's a little bit maybe even a kind of a formal part of this process of going that's through the, the self-evaluation. We self could have a board self-evaluation and a board member uh, a peer evaluation process and we could come up with questions that would be appropriate. That's something to yeah. think about. I can't Bob. believe I'm hearing this conversation, but uh, uh, it, it's called an election. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, we are all politicians, like the term or not. Okay. And the idea that politicians, members of a legislative body, are going to collectively sit and judge one another is an absurdity. I, I like the idea that Mr. Aaron suggests one-on-one. -on -one. You know, if I'd like to hear what Mrs. Cordero thinks about me and my performance, I will ask Mrs. Cordero. Okay. I think that that's a matter for each individual board member to decide whether they want that kind of feedback. 
and that's a good point as well. We could decide whether or not we wanted to participate in that process or, or not, you know, what kind of evaluation you want, if you're comfortable with getting that from your peers, um, as long as it's not about board issues. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, there follows a number that we think are less important. Let's talk about that. Uh, I'll just read off the questions. Number 20 was the board often discusses its role in the management of the districts. Um, most people disagreed. They thought it was important, but not very important. Um, 21, the board often discusses the administration's role in policy making. Again, most people disagreed on that, but did not think it was as critical. Um, number 20. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know where I put my, I'm probably the number four there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's terribly important and, uh, and we, uh, you know, we read so much uh, stuff about the, ro the roles and responsibilities of the board and the roles and responsibilities of the, of the district and in my opinion it's all very asymmetrical. Uh, mostly saying that the board has no business uh, uh, in micromanaging or sticking its nose into the administration of the district and by the same token frequently we, we get examples of, at, at the, and not necessarily at the superintendent's office level, but somewhere in the system, people are making educational policy. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that that, ha that is an important issue. Uh, educational policy belongs in the legislative body. Well, and what I would chime in sort of uh, clarifying that is what I hear is that we have a policy that's not being followed. We've, we've created a policy, and at some lower level, um, a decision is made that, yeah, either they don't seek out whether or not there is a policy in place and just don't realize it, or else um, they'll make a decision that, uh, in this case, we're just, it's awkward, it's more difficult to follow the policy, so we're just not going to do it. And um, that is very important, and so thank yeah. you for clarifying, uh, for yeah. bringing that up. Um, and, it, mm -hmm. I'll, and I'll make this really quick. Um, for me, the issues there are the fact that, again, going back to our structures, I don't think the board has an opportunity very often, certainly not often, as it says here, to engage in discussions about our processes. Mm -hmm. um, the only time we, we really get to do that is if we're revising a policy. And then we talk about, okay, what do we think the policy should be? Or the pra What's often. Been? We write the policy because of what we think the practice should be. Um, but we, we don't have opportunities to sit around and dis really discuss very often. Susan? No. And I, I would just say I agree. And, and I think it would be really helpful to have a discussion of kind of the philosophy mm -hmm. of the role of the board in, you know, in, in in, this ma in the management of the districts because, like Annette said, when we read the policies, we're really just consumed with the details and the wording and, you know, it, I would like to take it up a higher level and just look at that, at our role as an overarching body in terms of how we craft our policies and what our guiding philosophy is. Um, that would be helpful for me. Yeah. I agree with Mrs. Deacon. I, I'm just reflecting that already in this discussion, uh, I've learned something and I've found, uh, I've thought of something that I, that I do that I don't think I want to do. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just, mm -hmm. just, the, just having the discourse uh, mm -hmm. is intrinsically valuable. Um, number 22, the board usually receives a full rationale for the recommendations it's asked to act upon. Um, this was a split. Three, two, agree, disagree. Um, any comments on this one? And we can move on to 23. Uh, at times, this board has appeared unaware of the need for board action and the impact of inaction within our community. Um, most people disagreed, but there was a uh, strongly agree and uh, strong uh, and agree, and um, almost everybody thought this was very important. Any comments on this one? Bob? Yeah, I, I think I was, I may have been one. I, I'm thinking particularly about uh, 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 what I think is our, our, our problems dealing with uh, disadvantaged and, uh, and minority students. And, and they're there, uh, the needs for action uh, and the impact of inaction are, are t to me, very obvious. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think even more obvious to a lot of the, of the people, uh, of the families and the kids. And I think we just 
This is related to other things we've talked about, but I think we don't do a very good job in that area. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, uh, Susan? Oh, and actually, I was one of I, I was in agree on this one too, and I and I think that my answer stemmed from the fact that um, actually even before I joined the board, but when we were sitting out in the audience, coming to meetings. Um, th and this, we saw this kind of parade of the special education parents. For those of us who weren't privy to what was going on behind the scenes or at the district level, it really seemed like there was no response or it wasn't timely. And so, um, you know, I think th I think s it, it appeared actually the board was <laughs> unaware of the need for action. And mm -hmm. and now I, I you know. Now, being in this job, I can understand maybe that wasn't always the case, but... No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the hard thing about this, yeah. isn't it? So many times, uh, the, with the way board meetings are set up, there is so much going on behind the scenes that's not, uh, you know, that's not part of a board meeting. Right, right. So that, that can but, be hard. But there must be ways for the board to be able to better communicate to the public, we're working on it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, sometimes it feels like we don't do enough of that. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on this one? Um, let's move on to 24. At times, this board has appeared unaware of the impact its decisions will have upon our staff. Um, again, this was most agreed, uh, a, few, a couple disagreed. Very important, however. Any comments on this one? To me, that's another one that speaks for itself. We, um, we sometimes, even some of the things that I've heard today, saying well we can do this and we can do that and i'm thinking and i immediately think okay who's going to do who's that gonna do it yeah and they're what not, are they they're not taking notes and what are they <laughs> not going to do <laughs> if they have to do that yeah um so it's and it's it's understandable because we're trying to be creative and proactive i mean those are things we'd mm -hmm. like to be we want to come up with ideas but then you have to think through the process and so I do agree, and, and uh, as it says, at times, you know, mm -hmm. I do agree that that happens. Yeah. Um, Susan, did you want to speak oh, on that one? I was just thinking to myself that um, that when we're when board members are inclined to propose, maybe serving staff or you know asking for input from principals and all, that we should always be aware of of ways that we might be able to do that that are not too burdensome. Um, Sometimes I think we really need the information. Sometimes it's like, well, that would be nice to have, you know. But we go out to the sites and we realize how busy people are, and you know they're filling out CPR surveys, and you know, <laughs> and they're stressed. And it's, you know, I think that's a good way to be reminded actually of, of how busy they are is to be out there. And and but but maybe informally we can get information ourselves other ways too. Um, Ed, I, it seems to me that sometimes we think staff has been involved in the process and knows about the process or agrees with the process and that may not be true all the time and so the more we can do to make the staff aware of what is happening um, and and get the feedback um, so we can be assured that it's not going to have a negative impact or at least we put it this way at least we know what the impact is because there are times we've done things and then we find out the impact after the fact and that's not a good place to be. <laughs> that's not a good yeah. place to be. Yeah. Uh, number 26. No, no, sorry, number 25. Hmm. I feel comfortable speaking my mind on key issues. Wow, most of us strongly agreed on that. It was very important. Um, and it's. There's a clerical error here. I was supposed to be in column on the right. Strongly disagree on that. You were. <laughs> you don't feel comfortable speaking your mind on key issues. <laughs> <laughs> Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> sure, Bob. <laughs> okay, uh, number 27. The board discusses future trends in the larger environment that may present specific... Did we skip 26? Oh, I did. Sorry, I'm getting a little uh, ahead of myself. This board spends sufficient time listening to different points of view before it votes on an important matter. And that, again, ties back to one of the questions on the previous page. Um, most people thought this was important, and most people disagreed that we spent yeah. sufficient time on it. Any comments on that one? Annette? Well, certainly for me, the issue was different points of view, because I think often we get the same point of view for long periods of time. Um, we'll have a group come and speak one after another after another, but they're all saying the same thing. They're all bringing the same point of view. Or 
we have a small group of people who will come to meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, so we hear them a lot, but it's all the same point of view. Um, and it may be that in that particular issue, that's sort of the primary view. And so it's reasonable that that's going to be the one you get all the time. Or it may even be the only, you know, really, you know, valid or, or rational uh, perspective. But for most of our issues, that's not the case. For most of our issues, there are a whole variety of points of views that exist out there. We just, I don't think we often hear all of them, or even the majority of them. Susan? Um, it's really interesting because I answered agree, but I wasn't reading the question the same way you were because I think in my mind I was thinking we allow for different points of views to be presented, um, but in fact you're right. I mean, there are many times when we don't hear a, v a range of perspectives on a single issue, and, and I don't know how we enhance that. That's I mean, right. how, yeah. how do we get more people to come? I mean, if, if you know, the silent majority or whatever. I mean, how do you tap into those people mm -hmm. and, um, and have them come and speak? Well, I think that sometimes you have to seek it out. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to, I mean, this is one of the hardest things as a board member, when you have a vocal minority here, um, when you've heard from a silent majority or, or ramifications that, um, that only, you can only present uh, as a board member, but you don't have people here saying it, um, that's, it's a very difficult position that we find ourselves in sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the, yeah, I mean, it's structurally a, a problem. Mm -hmm. People come because of their of special interests, and, that, and I'm not using that in a pejorative sense. Uh, the, general, the generalized all-purpose uh, board watcher is a very rare person. We've had them. <laughs> And their parents, usually their spouses say, stop, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a problem. And, and you know, how do you, uh, we, we, we're not a polling agency, and I can't imagine we're going to start polling to, to get a, a more diverse uh, and more representative input. It's a problem. Susan? This was one thing that I, that really made me think about this was in the FICMAT report, and it never really came out, um, at least in our discussions real publicly was that something like 70% of the people surveyed thought we were doing a fine job. And yet, um, you know, those who were here clearly had issues, valid issues, but those 70% were never really heard or their voices were never, um, w we didn't hear what they had to say or, you know, so anyway, that was, that really struck me and mm -hmm. I was frustrated by that too. Yep. And, and then? Um, I also think that it goes back to the issues that we had, um, and I've raised a couple of times, but also other people have raised aspects of this too. Um, how do we do outreach so that we will hear from these different groups? And, you know, I've suggested meeting in different places where s different uh populations of people are more likely to attend but there's there's also other things and other people have other ideas where we can you know we can specifically invite certain groups to attend we can you know there's just, there's a variety of things we can do so i think um we've it, it goes back to being proactive i feel like we we have lots of years of evidence that what we're doing does not typically produce a very diverse audience. Yeah. So if we keep doing it, we can anticipate not having a very diverse audience. So we have to do something else. Um, number 27, the board discusses future trends in the larger environment that may present specific opportunities or problems for the district. Again, this also ties into the proactive question. Um, most people disagreed with it and felt that it was important or very important. Um, any comments on this one? We've kind of discussed it already. Um, number 28. Once a decision is made, board members work together to see that it is accepted and carried out. Now, um, I'm going to guess that the one member who did not uh, respond to this question was um, Moi? <laughs> Toi, oui. <laughs> so well, I, I read. I simply read it, and you know, I, I I had images of more than two people working together, and unfortunately, I yeah, I don't think we can do that. <laughs> well, I think it comes yeah. back to as a board, it goes back to the accountability question. 
-hmm. How are we at, at board meetings uh, or, you know, in board briefs, the, rep yeah. the types of yeah. reports that we request, are we following up on uh, decisions that have been made by board majority and making sure that they're being carried out in in a meeting session uh, rather than anything ah, that's uh, so to be done. This means like implementation. Uh -huh. Ah, then I then yeah. I then I misread it completely. Yeah, and what we saw is that uh, most people don't feel uh, this. This it, it just ties right back into the accountability uh, piece. We're not doing what we need to do to make sure. So that I would, in other words, this. If, if I had struck the word accepted, mm -hmm. that changes the meaning. Uh, that eliminates the any Brown Act problem. Okay. We're talking about implementation. Well, it doesn't limit nothing. Ever eliminates the Brown Act problem. Nothing it's always there, to. but. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, Annette? I also saw it as um, also how we interact with the public so that um, once a decision, let's say a decision gets made and I don't happen to agree with the decision, I voted no on it, okay. but it's been made, it's something that the, the district is going to do, do I work together with, together meaning as a body mm -hmm. um, with the board to present it in the public in a way that is likely to produce success? Or do I go about saying, well, I think it's a really stupid idea and I don't know why my other colleagues supported it and I think you shouldn't have your child do this at all. Um, so I took it in that way, mm -hmm. um, which was a, a different way too. That, that was actually the way I read it too. Mm -hmm. um, that once a board has, has, once the board has made a decision, whether you agree or not with that decision, I think it's counterproductive to undermine you know, that decision. Um, as long as you you know you've come to terms with with it, well, Ed. Yeah, uh, and ex I agree totally with, with that. But the pro not the problem, but the issue comes when you vote no on something, and a reporter calls you and says, "Why did you vote no?" You know, it's awful hard to say. Well, I voted no, but that's immaterial because it was passed, and therefore I support it 100 percent. That's a hard words to come out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's, it makes it very it makes it very difficult to answer that question. Um, because you can draw the wrong, the vote no has many, many different variables to it. You might be totally for the main vote, but there might be just something about it that caused you to vote no. And so the wrong, you know, you can get the wrong um, interpretation from a no vote, and the tendency is to want to make sure that the interpretation is a correct interpretation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but I agree, I agree totally. Once the vote is made, we support it. Bob? I'm thinking of, of Edward Kennedy. Uh, he, he voted against the Iraq war and he worked tirelessly to oppose it and to bring public opinion around, uh, which I think is perfectly appropriate behavior for an elected representative. Uh, I, I recently published an article that is critical of the bridge program after the program was adopted by the board. Uh, that for me is a matter of belief about what is good for kids. Uh, it's also very consistent with values of many of my, of my constituents. Uh, I will continue to try to bring opinion around such that that program would be abolished. And I think that's completely appropriate behavior for an elected representative. Any other comments? I, I, I echo that. I spent 20 years in organized real estate and I was often the no vote. But during the 20 years, sometimes everybody came around to a yes vote. And there's just a way of, of doing that, working for your beliefs. And I believe that totally appropriate. Any others? Annette? Yeah, I was, I think that, I mean, I think all is anybody here who thinks that they shouldn't speak their values or, you know, adhere to their values. Um, I don't, so uh, yeah, it's not, that's not an issue. That's not the issue. I think the issue is there are times when it's really an issue of a value, a, a core value that you hold, and there are times when it's just an issue of getting your way. And or I'd say, I really would have preferred that it would have been like this. I can think of many decisions that have been made by the board that I really completely opposed. Um, and I really would have preferred that it go the other way. And to a certain extent, it, it was a very strong value. But you ha I also think that there's, Im that there's, you have to really choose those carefully because to just 
constantly be critical of any decision that doesn't go your way, first of all, I think undermines your credibility because people just think you just complain when you don't get your way. But also, I think some of those decisions um, are to have students and families not feel sort of com comfortable with that is actually going to undermine their ability to be successful in the, in the school system. Um, and so you have to say, well, okay, I don't like it, but it's better for the students to at least have some, or the students or the family to at least have some, uh, what do I want to say, some faith that it will work. Mm -hmm. And it's better for me to help make it work the best that it can rather than to continue to to try to undermine it, which is going to actually hurt the student's progress. Um, so I think, I agree, I think we all have that, and, and certainly I think the war, you know, was a clear example of where mm -hmm. it's a real moral issue. But, you know, I'm sure there are many instances of Senator Kennedy, I mean, he could not have made it in the Senate as long as he did without some degree of compromise. Mm -hmm. Well, what I would like to see is, um, when we've made a decision where some of us are yes or no, and there, again, I've been the no vote on things where I really think that I'm right and you're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would like us to wait and get data back because on almost all those decisions, if we, if we follow through and go back and give it a reasonable amount of time, um, uh, you know, probably some of us are going to be able to say, I told you so. <laughs> um, not that that's anything that I would ever want us to start doing, but to be able to recognize when, uh, when if, if it was a bad decision, that we can work together as a board and, and change that. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that's what's going to lead to a change in a vote more than anything, mm -hmm. is if we give it a chance to work and then go back and revisit it. I think that that's critical. You know, I, I'd like to follow up on this war analogy just briefly. Um, we saw an awful lot of bumper stickers that said, I support the troops, but not the war. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's germane here in that when we criticize something that um, the district has decided to do or the board has decided to do, we need to be really careful that we're not sweeping staff and teachers, people like that, in, into our you know decision not to support something because I think they're put in the hard position of implementing a program that the board has approved, and if there's a, a critic of that program, then necessarily the staff that are implementing that program come under, under fire, and, and I think that's probably not fair to them. So I think maybe the way to frame criticism is to say, you know, I understand my colleagues and I differ on this. This is what, what, what I believe, but, you know, I also um, would hope that, that the staff are not subject to that kind of... of um, and what about the First yeah. Amendment, Mrs. Deacon? Well, well you, you can, you're free to say whatever you want. I mean, okay. we know Thank that. Thank you. I appreciate we know that. that. Of course you are. Um, I'm just suggesting that, that we think about there's, there's always repercussions from our, our words that maybe are unintended consequences um, to those who are not even involved Sometimes in the decision. Sometimes silence has more unintended consequences than speaking out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anybody on this board who seeks to undermine any decisions. I know of people on this board who disagree, and I know of people who are vocal about their disagreement. Uh, I don't know anybody on this board who is constantly critical of everything that doesn't go his or her way. Uh, if, if, that were, if I applied that to me, uh, an awful lot of things don't go my way, and I would have a publication list an arm long. Uh, in my particular case, I'm very selective, and it happens to be about things that I think are very important, uh, and I think that the public should know about. And I and uh, I just think it's wholly inappropriate, to, through one guise or another, to try to uh, stifle public criticism of public policy. And I certainly don't think it's the place of this board to be engaged in efforts to curtail or in any way restrict public criticism of public policy. We're a public agency. If we can't stand the criticism, can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Moving on to number 29, uh, the board has been known to reverse its position based on pressure from the community. Um, most people 
disagreed with that. Uh, again, people felt that this was a little bit less important. Um, uh, I would hope that when we get pressure from the community that there is a good reason for that pressure. Um, so this could be read in, a multiple, uh, in multiple ways. And then number 30 was members of this board observe rules of decorum. And the majority agreed with this. The majority also felt this was a little bit less important. I think it's very important that we uh, uh, observe rules of decorum, and I think it does help us um, uh, as a body when we are a little bit uh, stricter with Robert's rules of order. Um, and I know that whoever is in the pre president's role really has to remember to do that. Um, but uh, uh, I think it's very important for the community to see that that we can be civil with each other. Bob? One, one form of a breach of decorum is for a board member to get personal about another board member. And I think we've had d deficiencies in this area. And you and I have had a conversation and, uh, uh, and I agree with you when you say it would, it's not appropriate for a board member who feels offended in that sense to respond directly to the party who we, he or she feels is making the criticism, but rather to call, to ask the president of the board to call the member to order, because that is a breach of decorum uh, according to Robert's rules of order. You don't get personal in a legislative body or a parliamentary body. And it makes you want to go back and read the opening of Pickwick Papers again, <laughs> which has a wonderful scene. I don't know if you guys remember uh, of the rules of order. Yeah, I'll just comment that uh, our president does a wonderful job on this. Thank and you. I, th I think I think the meetings this year have been 99.9% uh, .9 uh, truly good, and there's been uh, very, very little uh, lack of decorum. So uh, you do a great job. Thank you. Um, uh, there's always something to learn every single meeting. I want to second that, so. too, while we're giving feedback yeah. to board members. I, I yeah. totally agree. I think you've done a terrific job, Kate. Thank you. Um, so that's the list of the questionnaire uh, questions. We do have open-ended questions. Um, I'm not going to read them all off. If there's anything that a board member wants to highlight at this point, what I would hope is that we uh, have, we've all read through these at this point and that we keep coming back to them. Um, we need to keep this assessment and as we're working over the course of this year, um, we keep coming back to, the, to areas and to talking with Brian um, as we meet with him uh, about some of the things that were brought up and what we can do. I hope that this is not just an exercise in, in talking um, and that uh, the areas that we brought up and some of the comments that we made are things that we put into action. Well, that was going to be my question. Like, now that we've had this discussion, which is, to me, a, a pretty amazing thing because we don't get to do this um, very often or ever. Mm -hmm. um, what, what will we do with these comments now? Where will we go with them? How will we follow up on this in a way that allows us, or, or maybe, I, maybe I should ask the question, will we follow up on this in a way that allows us to continue the discussion? Because I can see us coming back with just a list and then sitting down with it in a much more formal meeting setting where we kind of go back into our same routine where we don't get a real chance to discuss it. So. That's my question. Well, we could put together, um, we could make points of, of certain sort of action uh, suggestions that board members made and then revisit. Uh, we could have Brian, uh, <laughs> because he has nothing better to do. <laughs> uh, we could have uh, the superintendent uh, uh, point out certain areas where, where he's doing some work based on suggestions and we can talk about it again. But maybe we just need to revisit this. Um, instead of revisiting it in a year, revisiting it in like three months, mm -hmm. um, something like that. Bob? Uh, I just, you know, I headed into this uh, uh, as a skeptic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, uh, the conversation has been very constructive. And if, if we went no farther than just having the conversation, it would have been well worth the time and effort. Okay. Ed? Uh, two or three things. One, uh, maybe Bob and Susan could revisit the questions and tweak some of them that cause some discussion. Yeah. Uh, so the next time we do this, we won't have the same critique. Uh, yeah. Two, uh, for the member of the public who happen to be watching, the actual results and the grading and the actual responses to the open-ended questions 
are on the website under uh, the agenda and attachments. They're well worth reading. Uh, what I found interesting, I couldn't remember which ones I wrote. I could associate with several of them. <laughs> you know, so it was a really a strange feeling. I said, well, yeah, I wrote that. No, and then I read another one, oh, I wrote that. Um, so I think we, there, there's a tremendous crossover among us on our answers to the open-ended questions, and I think there's a lot of meat there uh, that could be looked at. Okay. Uh, any other comments? All okay. right. We will go ahead and move on to item B2. Um, we're, uh, we, we gave it the amount of time I think that we needed for this self-evaluation, so I'm pleased that we did that, but obviously we're running over. Um, so here is a review of the 0910 board focus goals. Yeah, let me give you a little backup to this, um, background on this. These board focus goals were adopted last, uh, at the end of last fall, I think it was about November of last year. And uh, some of the, well, many of them were very similar to board focus goals we had had in the past. A number of the student achievement goals uh, have not changed or have changed only slightly. Uh, so uh, some of the things that we've been working on all along through the LEAP, through the single plans for student achievement, uh, there are a number of initiatives that have been put in place, uh, have already been in place to address these goals. But leading into this year, we started talking with principals in February about the new board focus goals, started to gear up our sites so that in their planning, especially on their use of categorical funds, because some of these do relate to uh, students with, with uh, uh, categorical needs as well, that their single plans would address these goals. We have revised the, the data sheets, uh, and Davis Hayden did that early on so that they had new data sheets that reflected these goals, and uh, I would like to let, well, as we talk about the first goal in particular, I'd like to uh, invite Robin Swoski to speak to what we have been doing and where we expect to go with this. Now, uh, I know some questions have come up about a strategic plan. There was a strategic plan to handle goals years and years ago. Yeah, that's over. Uh, in fact, I think we've taken it off the website. I mean, it's really no longer valid. And we haven't written this up as if it's a strategic plan. I mean, it is not the kind of thing that, that we said, okay, let's plan to, to make these changes. Let's plan to do these things as a way of making these changes. This has been a long process, in fact, a multiple year process that has been evolving. And the issues of, um, of having AVID programs, for example, of, uh, of use of data, continuous use of uh, monitoring, the, of the, um, the PLCs, uh, the various things that, that schools are doing, uh, having principals spend time in classrooms, really monitoring instruction and, and giving feedback on learning and instruction are things that have been really long-term processes. Now, we do have the line down below. I mean, I mean, we have three major goal areas, one in student achievement, one in student safety and school climate, one in communication. And then there's a line down below that in order to support the goals, the board will. And the first bullet is to begin discussion on an updated strategic plan, review other existing district plans for fidelity and effectiveness of, of uh, implementation, which fits the discussion we just had as a board uh, just a few minutes ago. And this is a case where rather than uh, start from the beginning and say, well, let's develop a plan to handle this, we want your input into this process because we're really well into that process. It's been a multiple year process, particularly in student achievement, but we do want your feedback on it. Um, Would you like to take each yeah, of these let's, individually? Let's, let's look in the board will section before we do anything yeah. else. and. Um, I think I was probably one of the ones that uh, was suggesting that we look at the updated strategic plan. Uh, you know, we are years out of date on it. It was not implemented faithfully uh, when it was done. Um, but my mind has sort of been changed over the p past few months because of the circumstances with the district, uh, the current circumstances. Because when we looked at this last fall, I was not anticipating the kind of budget nightmare that we're in. A proper uh, full community strategic plan process costs money and you need to have an outside uh, facil facilitator working on it. Um, 
And so I'm much more at the point where I think we, uh, and I look at this as a dynamic doc document, that we may need to change that to uh, review existing uh, district district plans for fidelity, because we have ones for technology and, and so on, and so diversity, and um, maybe it's a time for us to get those in a board brief for us to read again and um, and then bring to the board if we feel there are areas that need discussion. I don't know how other members feel about it. Any thoughts on that one? Bob? I, I'm a little confused. Uh, uh, for number, number one, I would make that a separate bullet. Mm -hmm. from the strategic plan, mm -hmm. uh, but number two, uh, I didn't quite understand what you meant. Uh, well, I meant that maybe we should have a bullet that says review, but eliminate the begin discussion on an updated strategic plan because yeah. I don't think that we are, f uh, we, are we have other areas, uh, right now I feel like we're focusing so much on special education and on the budget, and those areas need our focus. Yeah. And I'm not sure that this is the right um, right time. Well, at the same time, administrators can go forward and put together strategic plans around student achievement. Um, and I think that that's really important and, and, and great for them to be doing that. Um, but maybe we're not at the whole community wide. We're not ready for that right now. No, I, 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 I share that part. It's just when the review of other existing district plans for fidelity and effectiveness of implementation, I'm not sure. You said something about that that I didn't fully really understand. Oh, right. well, we have existing plans, like the uh, plans on technology, plans for diversity, and there's uh, there's a library uh, strategic plan that we could simply get in board briefs, uh, you know, pace ourselves uh, and take a look at those uh, and then bring forward issues to board meetings related to those plans that are more current. Um, uh, yes, Bob? For me, the issues of implementation have to do with an, another step down of specificity. Mm -hmm. uh, are we implementing, you know, uh, uh, Ed brought it up, uh, you know, uh, read 180, mm -hmm. uh, follow through on implementation on that, professional learning communities, and we know there have been problems on that. Uh, the, the, ma the areas where we've got these major commitments, maybe, maybe plan is the wrong word here because plan That's has a, good. a plan in an organization means something special, right. programs. Where, where we, we follow up on the implementation, uh, what's happening out there, are they really doing it, and uh, uh, the idea being that by, if, if we're paying attention, it helps you folks get their attention. Uh, so Bob, would your suggestion be that we change the first bullet to review district programs for fidelity and effectiveness of implementation? Yeah. I think that sounds good. Susan? And I, I like the fact of that doing that would directly take us back to these student achievement bullets yes. because that's what we're really, you know, I've said we care a lot about and so when we review these these programs, I think we will always want to review them through the filter of, of the student achievement items. Mm -hmm. Annette? I just want to make sure, um, if we take out the word plans and just include programs, I, I guess I'm wondering what the effect of that will be um, because I'm just wondering if we could say plans and programs or if we don't need the plans. I think we, we would because okay. there are those okay. plans that I would like us to take a look at. Okay, no, I, I'd like to look at them too, but yes. I, but uh, sometimes the plans are, are at a certain level of generality yeah. where mm -hmm. it's sort of like, what, mm -hmm. okay, connect me to reality. No, I can I see adding the programs. I just. Yeah. Okay. didn't okay. know we want to eliminate plans. May I ask that we take a step back from that for just a moment. Um, I think what is one of the important issues here is communicating the plan. What is the current plan? And you know we've developed it through the LEAP, we've developed it for school uh, site plans, we'll be bringing those to you, each site is working on it. And I believe there are ways to communicate what the current plan is. And even though some of those initiatives may have been in place a number of years, they're still important initiatives to accomplish these goals. And uh, I think it's still calling it a, a plan. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't know about the word strategic. And, you know, I always wonder about whether that's just a piece of paper or whether we're actually going to mm -hmm. operate on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what's critically important is whether this is something that, that we're really doing or whether it's simply something that we have on paper, uh, that I would like, uh, certainly from staff's point of view, uh, to in 
engage staff in the process, and, and Robin and I have already talked about this, of communicating what the current plan is so that it, it's in a summary fashion rather than uh, a large complex, oh, well, we've got 2,500 employees, they're delivering all sorts of services to students, here's the litany of services, here's the litany of programs. Those that pertain most to these goals and how we think we can accomplish these goals, I think are the ones that need to be highlighted. So we would like to put together a doc document that explains our current plan. No, I think that's a, that's a good idea, and that could be part of the plans that we're reviewing. <laughs> and here yeah. it is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Robin's been looking at models. <laughs> Already lots of color. Yeah. Okay, um, the next bullet was implement a K-12 gang prevention and intervention program. I, I, I see no reason to change that for a board focus goal. Develop a district-specific school safety survey. Provide customer service training tailored. I, 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 yeah. I want to know what does that district-specific school safety survey? Does that mean we're checking out on the uh, uh, Healthy Kids Survey, the California Healthy Kids Survey? We had talked about augmenting the Healthy Kids Survey and having items that that we think are important in addition to those items. Oh, so it's augmenting. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I think those are yeah. very important to keep using the. California Healthy Kids Survey because there's a lot of benchmark data out there. And we're still required to use it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, great. Or um, to get the grant money that, that may be that's that's a school, so safety. <laughs> school safety money, right? Uh, and I brought for I mentioned the provide customer service training. The next bullet was have board email links from the district website. The nice thing about that, that is completed. So we can cross that off the list. What what is the customer? And then, uh, 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 mm -hmm. yes, Bob. You're so quick. <laughs> Provide customer service training tailored for school districts for the district office staff. Why are we restricting customer service training to the district office? I mean, uh, do, uh, don't, do the sites, could the sites benefit like, from some customer service training? It doesn't seem yeah. like we should limit it. Well, just this is something that, w that we're wanting to do district wide. In fact, Barbara developed a whole you know, process this last spring, and I said, hold, 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 because, uh, because we want to go into this year and we want to launch it in a big way uh, so that it does include district office, it includes sites, it includes our management meetings when we talk to them about responding, being responsive to people, returning calls, responding to emails, that kind of a thing. Could this wording be changed to reflect just that? Just to eliminate the word office. We yeah. could just for yeah. district staff yeah. instead of just get rid of the office. Um, and then uh, hold one meeting or workshop per semester at a school site. That is still, uh, that's going to happen. <laughs> so um, we'll have one this fall uh, at a school site and then one in the spring. Um, but we should leave that on. My suggestion would be that um, I'll let you guys talk about uh, the, the student achievement part, but um, for the, this part, what the board will section, um, may I have it on a consent agenda that we vote on updated 2009-10 uh, focus goals, Annette? Two questions. Mm -hmm. One is, um, or well, actually one is a suggestion. On the whole one meeting on a school site, mm -hmm. uh, since we did hold a meeting last year at La Cumbra, mm -hmm. um, I would like to suggest that we try to hold a meeting on the east side, at one of our east side schools. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question I had was, one of our ongoing workshops, oh, well, I mean, sorry, focus goals, actually, it's, it's included in two focus goals, is this trying to increase the number of underrepresented students in higher yes. level courses in the hopes that it also helps them achieve eligibility for uh, CSU and UC and et cetera. But I don't see anything specific to that in our the board will bullets. Oh, I thought that was the first bullet in the plan. In the plan? Yes. In, 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 in I mean, that's, that's a big emphasis on these initiatives. Yes. But I, but guess, I think, uh, oh, go, go ahead. I'm go sorry. right ahead. You know, I'm looking at, for example, a gate, and this is probably true about AP as well. Um, the others, maybe don't have as long a history in the district. Yes. But so that's why I'm specifically looking at Kate because it seems to have the longest history in the district. Mm -hmm. um, 
that we've had this goal forever. I mean, this has always been the goal. Um, it's been decades that this, this, this particular program, but I don't want to, I mean, the other programs are in the same situation, it's just that they, they've been the longest. Um, it's been decades that this program hasn't met our goal. I, I go back to that item we had on the survey of um, does the board recognize the implications of its lack of action mm -hmm. um, or the effects that the lack of action has. I mean, I've had a point where I want to say either you meet the goal or you eliminate the program. Well, in fact, we because we'd it, like you know, to take after 20 on. years. Yes. It seems like we've given, you know, we've made a, lot, a long enough good face effort to try to achieve it without being heavy handed. Now I think we have to be heavy handed. This is good. Um, um, I won't say? spend a lot of time on this, but I think we need to come back to that very question. Uh, we've spent a number of years trying to increase access and accessibility to the GATE program uh, in a way that's objective. And you know, here we're typically talking about you know, secondary level GATE programs and students are either in or they're not in and they've gotten in through some mechanism that's an objective mechanism. We've tried to be more inclusive in that. Uh, we tried to go to instruments that, that were nonverbal. Uh, you know, those didn't achieve what we, what we thought we needed to achieve. Uh, doing it through instruments and measurements uh, hasn't achieved that end. And at the secondary level, we're one of the few high schools, high school districts, high school operations that even have gate classes. Gate, the title gate itself is a restrictive mechanism. And almost all high schools in California have gone to honors courses. And honors courses are open to all takers. I mean, if a student wants to apply themselves at that level of rigor, then they can enter an honors course. And that may apply to students who are formerly GATE students. I mean, in most districts in, in the state, this is how it operates. Uh, it may apply to students who came up through a GATE program and who are just expecting to take those. It may apply to AVID students who think they can be successful and we can provide supports for. Uh, we'd really like to rethink that whole structure of gate classes, especially at the secondary level. But I know that that's a larger discussion, and I think we ought to bring it back for board discussion. Um, so that could be a board focus goal that we bring in, that we um, have dis uh, discussions over the course of the year on the district gate program. Yes, no. Bob? Uh, I, I share uh, Mrs. Cordero's concern, and uh, it's very frustrating. Uh, I'm just browsing through the data that uh, Dr. Hayden has very uh, wisely put up on the uh, internet, and you know these time series numbers are just de really depressing. Uh, and I and I and I also think that like you folks have probably tried everything, and I. But then, then I try to reconcile that with, uh, as you know, I have a lot of interest in, in small charter schools because I've found a whole bunch of them through the data uh, base that seem to be doing a very good job preparing disadvantaged Latino kids for college and universities. And I've visited a ha at least a half a dozen or more of them in both in Northern and Southern California. And uh, they have the key. now. I understand there are some variables there having to do with self-selection and so on that, that may make a difference. But then, I, but then I say, okay, so maybe we can create that as well, uh, some kind of a, sele a process that is self-selective. At least what you get is a, I'm thinking of one 500 student school down in, uh, uh, in the uh, Hoover District in, in LA. 75, it's, it's about 90% Latino and very poor. 75% of these kids are going to right out into four-year universities. So they're meeting the A to Gs. Uh, yes, it may be selective, but wouldn't it be nice if we had 75% of 500 Latino kids going out in, direct into four-year universities? So, uh, I mean, cause I, you know, I understand the methodological problem of, of, of that selection bias, but then I look at the, at the results and I say, you know, selection bias be damned. We need this kind of output. And, and, and I'm not saying to make everything a charter school, uh, but I'm saying that, that 
it, I think it would be worth our, since nothing else is working, uh, that it would be worth putting some creative energy into trying to see if you can extract from that charter school context the essential ingredients of, of their success and implant them into, into our school environment. And I don't know what that means, but, uh, but I think that would, I, we've tried everything, and, uh, and, and, and these people are, are doing it. Now, you know, uh, God, whether you read this stuff or not, but like at the, at the, uh, at the, at the junior high school level, and, and maybe it has to start there, and we're, you know, the KIPP schools now have this, uh, uh, it's called the KIPP Hartwood Academy up in San Jose. I mean, this is a really pretty uh, disadvantaged place. They're, they're running an API for disadvantaged kids, over 900. Uh, well, KIPP keeps them there all day. KIPP is very structured. Okay, let's, let's look at it. Let's look at it. We, mm -hmm. We've got to do something. How about wording uh, uh, for a board, uh, the board will do it along these lines of um, discuss the underrepresentation of minority students in the district gate program and investigate um, model schools. Alternative models? Al alternative models. Thank you. Can I, I just want to yes. point out that Latino students are the majority in our school, minority. Mm -hmm. So discuss the underrepresentation of majority students. Of <laughs> Latino students. Latino and specifically. Okay. If you say socioeconomically disadvantaged in our community, uh, you get a, a big piece of it, but not all. And and, and now the database all. has yeah. broken that out separately, so we can see that effect. Okay. Yeah. So we'll 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 say Latino. Okay. So I'd like to bring these back in a, on a consent agenda basis for a updated. Uh, Board focus goals, and now I'll turn it over to um, <laughs> Brian and Robin. Okay, um, this is getting me really excited. <laughs> I don't know if I can speak articulately now because the topics you're talking about are, I mean, I think it's just foundational in why we still have our achievement gap. Um, I'm taken back to just communities when I spent the summer, two summers ago, with a, a lot of secondary teachers and counselors, and um, we started talking about the achievement gap. We had a, a large kind of informal but structured discussion on it, and many of their comments came back to our GATE program, actually, and actually going all the way back to the elementary GATE program and how that creates and starts this tracked system that we just don't get rid of, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So there's, I think there's a lot of discussion around um, how to have an effective GATE program and serve our gifted and talented students because that's really important, and to be much more inclusive in how we have our advanced programs and, and in include. Can I ask a question? Yes. This sounds much more in bigger topic than strictly a focus goal, and is this a proper place to be talking about making changes to the gate program. I'm not talking about making changes. Okay. I'm just commenting on your what you just said you will do, having that discussion. That's exciting to me because I think it plays into every one of these focus goals. Um, and, and getting right to that, I, I won't take a lot of time because basically we had some great gains this year. We have not been, although the achievement gap is still there and that we need to really you know, accept that that is kind of one of those brutal facts that's that's still there. We're making great gains with all students, or, or good gains with all students. So our LEAP, you saw in June, our single plans you will see, there won't be a lot of big changes in those because they're following the same plan, and if you want to call it strategic plan, that's the in curriculum and instruction part of it. You can because all of the things we started we're going forward with. I've been looking at, Brian alluded to, some of the um, plans that other districts have done. Whittier Union High School has a really nice spelled out plan for curriculum and instruction and it's very, very similar to what we're doing. Um, Long Beach has a strategic plan where the board has a, a specific um, initiative around 
preparing students for post-secondary, all students for post-secondary. Their first two goals are almost exactly like ours. Um, goal one, all students will attain proficiency in the core content areas, and many of the specifics are just what we have in place. Their second goal is that all students will graduate from high school prepared for post-secondary and career options. Then they go on to talk about they have record numbers of students enrolled in AP classes. So they're following along the same lines. And these are two districts who have been very successful, and they have excellent numbers in, in those things. So, so basically, with our student achievement goals, um, how we've addressed these, and we've addressed them sort of globally because they all have to do with all of our students becoming proficient and above, involving many more of our underrepresented students in those high advanced classes. So being proficient, but then being more than that. And of course, that all plays into the AYP and, and a API, our federal and state performance targets. So the things that are, are right in place, and if I had to write our strategic plan today, they would be that we have common instructional materials, and that has become even more so over the last four years with all of the adoptions. Right now, the latest one with READ 180, and with those instructional materials, we have the intense training that goes along with it. So the SB 472 used to be a AB 466. Our teachers, great numbers of our teachers, if not 100% of our teachers, in the case of READ 180, 100% of our, our teachers implementing that program right now have been trained in seven days of training. So that's critical. To, you cannot, as Dr. Noel talks about, fidelity with implementation, you cannot do that unless you have the proper training. So we're making sure that that's in place. So that's number one. Common instructional strategies. So our systematic ELD that we had, we started with Susanna Dutro a few years back. We had coaches. That's more at the elementary level, but there are common instructional strategies at the secondary level. This is something we need to do more work on as far as our English language development. AVID is 4 through 12. That's common across our district. Those are key in instructional strategies. Those are just the best instructional strategies anywhere. And they're not just for our AVID classes. Those are across the curricular areas and, and all of our teachers. Um, and then we mentioned PLCs. That's kind of an umbrella around all of that where we are focused on our professional learning as educators and then we're really focused on the student work and what we're doing you know what what are we teaching kids how are we assessing it what are we doing when we find that they're not making progress and what how do we address that when we find they are making progress and they need more so that differentiated instruction the third thing is our district-wide essential standards and common assessments so we've identified our essential standards we just went through the elementary you saw a copy of the report card in the essential standards um, and then our common assessments. And so with EDUSOFT to be the um, system that we use that goes, you know, K through 12 um, to, to mark that. And then the common assessments, we're building that still. That's something that we have key pieces in place, but that's another place where we have a lot of growth to go. And this year is a key year for that, developing that. And then the final one is the pyramid of interventions or pyramid of support, if you will. And having that, the RTI, response to intervention at the elementary level in particular, um, the elementary principals have made that their number one goal for this year. They're gonna meet over time. They have their meetings set out. We're using a common um, resource, a book called DataWise from, um, we got this at our Standards Aligned Instructional Leadership Sale Training. It's one of the research books that we're using as a team, K-12. The elementary principals are using it, and I'm getting a companion book to that that is actually the, you know, not just the research, but how do you do it. They're going to use that throughout the year to have our response to intervention model very consistent throughout the district. It can't be cookie cutter because every school is different, but certainly the assessments used, all, you know, that whole response to intervention will be, the goal is to have that by the end of the year. The junior highs, as you know, have a much more consistent pyramid of interventions in place. We're looking at that K through 12, though, to make sure there are certain pieces that we all do and then others that we, we fall in and, and and make it appropriate for the school. So those are four, our four main goals. They're in the leap, they're in our plans. We're moving forward, we're not going in a different direction. Um, 
I feel like we've had good gains in that, but the attention to our underachieving, our underrepresented students in our honors and advanced programs, and then also the number of students who are eligible for admission to UC and our state universities, those are the pieces that as we build on that, you know, the foundational piece. Um, I know we'll see more results with that, but I don't believe we've made as targeted an effort in that, in those two areas as we can. I think we need to talk a little more about that, particularly at the secondary level. Obviously, you can't just put students in advanced placement classes. They have to be prepared and ready for it, and that's where our elementary schools that are building that foundation um, have a huge piece in it. Um, so we're meeting together again this year. All of our principals are meeting once a month with district staff, and then they have their separate um, real PLCs to focus on exactly these, these achievement goals or student achievement goals. So um, it's not a lot different, but I feel like we're really coming together with a much more structured, concise way of approaching it. I can put it in a strategic plan, too. To make it look all pretty, too. <laughs> yeah. Bob. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Robin's uh, comments. Uh, I've, I've been trying to understand uh, intervention programs, the pyramid so-called, you know, uh, and uh, reading quite a bit about it, and uh, the, also the uh, universal access requirements, uh, all the stuff in the uh, uh, frameworks. And I and I, I look at this stuff, and I say. Where's the money? Because to, to take kids who are two to three years behind grade level and bring them up to grade level, according to the, the research you're looking at, at best, you're going to get them two years up in one year. That's at best. But only if you spend the money. And you look at the class sizes in, in a, that are appropriate to those point, those, each level in that so-called pyramid. And, uh, and I... And then you and you and also then you look at the the workload of a teacher who is earnestly trying to implement universal access in a classroom. Uh, I I see an aid in there. Uh, I, I see somebody somebody has to administer it almost. It's it's uh, and I come away with a, a very big conclusion. Uh, if we're serious about bringing kids up to grade level, two big conclusions. One's we have to do it early. Okay. And a couple of thresholds would be six, you know, a, a benchmark at sixth grade, a benchmark at, uh, at eighth grade, and the other is we have to philosophically say we're going to spend the money. And 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 and, and uh, it's almost right to say if if you don't, and I'm, this is this is an abstract you, but if you talk if you're going to talk about really improving and, and really doing something about the, those bullet one and bullet four, uh, then. We have to be prepared to say, okay, we're going to spend at least double on those kids. Uh, it, it won't happen. In my, I, I'm, I'm convinced it just won't happen uh, if, unless we make that commitment right now, up front. We're going to spend the money. What, not whatever it takes. We can't go that far, maybe. But intervention class, 7 to 12 kids for intensive, 15 kids for, for a strategic level intervention. I mean... We, you have to say if if if, if you if you were serious about it, then we have to staff it at, at levels that are sort of like that, and that's just part of it. Now, where we get the money, I don't know, but it's a, but it's it's a matter of, of a of an in principle commitment. If I mean, we've got decades of data that it's not that nothing's working, uh, but we've ne but have we ever really spent the money that now when you look at what is recommended in the in the research literature and in the state guidelines. Uh, we're not spending it, and uh, and and you know to take a, a Hoover Institution point of view, throwing money at the problem won't solve it. I think I disagree with that. I think that we're not th that we're not allocating the resources that are that are necessary if we really seriously want to solve this problem. Can can I respond? Mm -hmm. um, first thing I want to comment before we get into the intervention we do have in place is that we actually you mentioned sixth grade and eighth grade. We look at third grade, if students are not, if kids can't read by third grade, we've got to pour it on. And even before, we're obviously with response intervention, identifying early on and, and getting some, some support. Um, 
I know that there's never a silver bullet, and I don't want to have anyone think that this is what we're feeling READ 180 is, but we've spent a lot of our resources on READ 180. We believe, and just in the initial, you know, we've had Cleveland School up and running now since July 16th. We really believe that this is our serious way of ad addressing this. Now, it starts at fourth grade. We're actually thinking about maybe in third grade at one of our schools. But it breaks down the size because you've got a classroom of, say, 30 kids or 33. They're in three different session sections. And so a teacher, qual highly qualified teacher, is working with eight kids at a time or 10 at the most. And then there are those on the computer that's very interactive, very um, oh, the kids and uh, motivation. I mean, the kids love it. And then there's another person in there as well working with another small group of, of students. And the instruction is targeted exactly where they want at an accelerated level to move them two years in one year and, and in some cases even faster. So that's the kind of thing that we will, in fact, I have in my notes. Read 180 updates on a monthly basis to the to the board. We need to show you exactly what's going on. We need to have examples. Um, we just got an example from a teacher at Cleveland yesterday that's totally amazed at the progress in his students. So, so are you saying are you saying to all of us uh, in response to Mike's statement that you have enough money for the Read 180? For for intervention. Oh, for intervention. of course not. For we intervention programs <laughs> no, to, to we don't. Solve bullets a, uh, we do not have four. enough money. No, we don't. How much do you need? Whoa. I believe, that, I believe that, that you folks should be coming to us saying, if you want to do bullets one and four, here's what it's going to cost. Well, well wow. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but we do have some real. I mean, that reminds me of... Uh, of Jack O'Connell responding to the every student must succeed at algebra in eighth grade and saying, well, we're billions of dollars shy uh, and just putting a price tag on it. And in fact, we've, we've made eight, $8.4 million in cuts in last year's budget and this year's budget and we're about to look for another $2.5 million in cuts. Uh, and all of those resources are stressed at this point and I, I, I appreciate that approach. I mean, that's a, no, let's it's step it's back and say, what would it really take yeah. to get this done? And then let, and then let, yes. us, let us adjust the priorities. Because we don't, we, don't, we don't have that estimate. And we say, okay, it's too easy. There's not a number sitting out there. Here's what we have to have for this job. Well, mm -hmm. we have all this and this and this. You can't, you can't adjust these priorities to, and expenditures to accommodate Right. And well, I want one, I just want to be a four. little bit I, I see completely how the money ties into our board focus goals. But I also want to be a little careful that we don't start too wide of a range of discussion. And in fact, I would like to wrap up the meeting at this point. Oh, okay, I appreciate um, having had a chance yeah. to make that point. I don't think I've have I ever made that one no, before? No, okay. no but that's because I, yeah. I, I, I say it privately to people and I mm -hmm. really believe it very strongly now. It's, uh, you know, and yeah. I wanted to say it to, to you folks. I, I, I would welcome the opportunity to make some hard choices that would move us forward on one and four. Okay. Um, Ed. Yeah, I'd just like to comment. This is the kind of discussion that I relish. I think this is fantastic. I'm only sorry we have no audience. <laughs> uh, not no audience, but we have no public <laughs> audience. <laughs> and it, you know, I, I, sort of, you know I sort of <laughs> wonder. Exactly public. You know, we, we, One playing games. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, this is the type of discussion the public should hear and be aware of because we had so many good ideas and thoughts. It's just sad that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if Friday morning at 9 o'clock kept them away or if they knew about it. I mean, it just, it, this was a great discussion. Excellent. Well, um, I think that we need to come back and do it in three months um, and have another workshop where we uh, get an update. We'll, we'll be seeing what progress we've made on the board will do list in three months. Um, and see where we need to put um, some heat on certain areas and, and what we can put move on to completed. Although I don't think in three months anything will be completed. Um, but, Madam President, yes. I just, uh, mm -hmm. I just, something you said, I'm just sinking in on me mm -hmm. that kind of wanted to, I, I don't know what you in intended, but to separate the financial issue from the focus goals is very artificial. 
I absolutely agree. And what I what I'm sort of thinking though to myself is that when we when we look at this again in three months, this might be the perfect time to say, well, um, is is this another update to uh, an, a new line on the board focus goals of a board will do? Um, is it will it at that point last year we adopted the board we, we deliberately went way out ahead and adopted 0910 in november because we wanted to affect the budget cycle um it was an advantage to us certainly and so uh, but in three months now we're, we're going to be talking about december um so maybe at that point uh we can be looking also at the 10 11 cycle and that's where i think that would just tie in so beautifully when to does it a single plan come in for us Part Sing of the timing of this single this plans time. come in typically uh, we, October. November. Yes, we will be starting them in October, finish in November. Mm -hmm. well, it'll be nice to have some priorities, even for that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's where that that's the only place any money could possibly come from. Mm -hmm. Annette. Well, I just wanted to add to that because I I agree. Um, I think that. <laughs> even under the best of circumstances in in education but certainly in dire circumstances as we are now too often the budget drives pedagogy rather than pedagogy driving the budget um, and so it would be we can't I mean clearly we have to operate within the realm of reality but um, it, to the extent that we can use our educational programs and the the priorities we have for those help set the groundwork for the for our budgetary process I would really welcome that and when the single plans come to us what we get are the 0910 <coughs> single plans that are you know everything's already budgeted paid for for the most part um, you know everything's put into effect where I think we can perhaps affect change is as we come out with the 1011 goals and and really ask principals to be thinking over the course of the spring as you're building it because they, their work is generally done by May in terms of the next mm -hmm. year's plans. Yeah. So, Susan. Oh, and <clears throat> it sounded like from uh, what Mr. Smith told us on Tuesday that we're actually probably facing more cuts, right? Mid-year cuts. Mm -hmm. So it's cuts. it certainly yes. seems to me that mm -hmm. when we think long and hard about those cuts, we're always thinking about you know these goals. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. we may have to cut staff in some areas. I mean, we have to ask you know, how much does that position contribute to us moving these goals forward? So I think we always need to keep that in our minds when we're, we're making our hard choices. Okay. Bob? Yeah, these, these goals float. They're kind of up here <coughs> floating around with no connections to things that are very practical and that guide, that, that guide specific actions. And, that, and I think that's part of our frustration. The goals, that we, we, as, you know, we make the goal and nobody, you know, that's it. With the board's finished for a year. Uh, but, right. But that's that's what the leap is about. That's what single plans are about. Yeah. That's yeah. What yeah. We should get up and recite the board focus goals with yes. the Pledge of Allegiance. That's an idea. <laughs> I pledge participation. Yeah. And we'll do the little scout. Yes. All right. Well, I think this was very productive. Uh, we'll come back and discuss this again in three months. And at that point, we'll also look at the 1011 goals. Uh, but we'll be reviewing and getting updates on on the progress for the 910 also. And we'll look at the at the board self evaluation again and see see where we are on that. All right. With no objection from my fellow board members.